And now is the official welcome. So we officially welcome you to today's session where we'll spend some time talking about the Part D redesign and uh, the earth shattering, right? That's what you see in the background here. The earth is opened up and shattered. The implications it might have for uh, Medicare beneficiaries and Medicare eligibles in particular. If you're not familiar, my name is Randy Lober, your growth marketing manager here at Action Benefits. My job in a number of ways is to help you independent agents grow your business. Uh, today, we're doing that by providing some education going on in the industry, why things are taking so long to get back to you about project releases and uh, all that kinds of stuff here. Joining me today is the lovely and talented Chelsea Smith. Chelsea, say hi to the people before we get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today in our Part D redesigned webinar. I am going to be second in command here. Thank you for coming. All right. Are you health insurance agents, Medicare agents, and uh, agency associates ready for the Part D redesign? Whether you are or you aren't, hopefully we'll get you one more step up that continuum here by the end of today's session by looking at a few things here today. We're going to examine what the Part D benefit will look like in 2025. Spoiler, not the same as it does in 2024. Um, we'll take a look at what that redesign means on for Part D premiums and what we know so far and some things that CMS is attempting to do about them and more on that attempt later on. We'll take a look at how this might impact things you, uh, your Medicare beneficiaries and eligibles know about uh, drug plans and how you might see things outside of premiums change as well. We'll take a look at what this all means for creditable coverage. So a lot of folks choose to uh, continue working after the 65, they choose to remain on their employer plan uh, if they're able to do so or if it makes sense for them to do so. But a change in the Part D benefits means that the definition of creditable coverage changes a little bit. The thresholds for creditable coverage change. So what do you do if come January 1, all of a sudden your folks no longer have creditable coverage? And we'll also close our time together here today, taking a look at the Medicare Prescription Payment Plan or the MP3. If you hear me say MP3 today, I'm not talking about the iTunes player used to call around. I, I sometimes slip into shorthand for the Medicare Prescription Payment Plan because there are one M and three Ps when you describe it. And that's really what I'm talking about here today. Part D redesign in general. On your screen is a chart from the Kaiser Family Foundation, the KFF you see in the bottom portion of the screen, showing you what the Part D benefit has looked like over plan year 2023, or in Medicare language, contract year 2023, contract year 2024, and contract what it will look like in contract year 2025. If you are a veteran in the industry, you are most used to what happened here in 2023. Uh, where for a long time you had the plans that looked like this. You had your deductible phase, you had your initial coverage phase, your coverage gap or the donut hole where coverage kind of uh, slipped away from folks for a bit. And then you had the catastrophic phase where even after you spend over $8,000 in drugs, your beneficiary is still on the hook for 5% more. Beneficiary cost here should note is represented in the dark blue uh, the plan cost is represented in purple, light blue is manufacturer's responsibility, and green is Medicare or the government. In 2024, they're uh, inspired or rather mandated, I guess is the better word, by the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, that beneficiary responsibility in the catastrophic phase went away. Instead, Part D plans picked up a bit more. Medicare still picked up the 80%. But if you look at 2025, things get real different real fast. There's still a deductible phase, but now there's only two stages of coverage after that. There's the initial coverage stage, which on, the, on a, a basic Part D benefit, your beneficiary is paying 25%. The Part D plan is paying 65% and drug manufacturers are picking up 10%. But in the catastrophic phase, the Part D plans are picking up 60% of that drug cost. Manufacturers are picking up 20 and the government is picking up the other 20%. What does that mean for us in real numbers? Well, the, in, on the Part D standard benefit, the deductible for this year is $590. And you inch the catastrophic phase, or your beneficiary rather, maybe you if you're Medicare eligible, 
Um, enters the catastrophic phase once they've hit that $2,000 out-of-pocket maximum that has been put in place by the Inflation Reduction Act. So this means for every dollar after $2,000 uh, that your beneficiary would owe, the carrier is on the hook for the large portion of that. So if you think about costly drugs, um, you know, I, I anything you're really like, if, if you're thinking about brand brand name drugs, brand name inhalers, maybe to control asthma or higher doses, anything I like, your tiers, threes, fours of formularies, uh, those get to be pretty expensive monthly expensive monthly fills and the, the drug plans are going to be putting an enormous part of that cost. I should mention though, when we talk about what you see here, uh, this is the basic Part D benefit. So this is the minimum standard coverage essentially that a Part D plan or a Part D sponsor has to offer. This is what you have to have uh, on the books to be able to offer a Part D plan. So you'll see here in the initial coverage phase, for example, on the basic benefit, your beneficiary would owe 25% uh, co-insurance in that phase. However, about 72% of beneficiaries right now are in, enrolled in what's called an enhanced plan. And enhanced plans allow uh, Part D sponsors, so whether they're a standalone Part D or a part of an MAPD, uh, those uh, enhanced plans allow them to kind of play with these numbers, play with these com uh, percentages where, where you see different co-pays, co-insurances, and uh, even lower deductibles, right? And they are allowed to play with those in the spirit of competition uh, and enticing enrollees into their plans. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is in terms of the basic benefit, <laughs> uh, because that's really what... Uh, grounds a lot of the conversation going forward, but know that you'll still see carriers able to and offering plans that look very different than what you see down here. You may still see uh, 30, you know, um, or rather, you know, 10% coinsurance, 20% coinsurance for some drugs, uh, so on and so forth. You may see varying deductibles and co-pays as well. As we go forward here, uh, there's a question then about who benefits from this Part D redesign? Who benefits from putting this $2,000 cap in? And if you look at the graph here, it shows you on average, or uh, not on average, how many beneficiaries would have met that cap if we if that $2,000 cap had been in place in 2021 and then takes a few look back, a look backward. Um, so in 2021, for example, it's the last year for which this data is available. There's about 61 and a half million uh, Medicare beneficiaries. In that year, one and a half million of them would have benefited from the cap, or about 2.4%, 2.5%, depending on how you do your rounding there. But one year is kind of a small window to judge who overall, right, would benefit from this program. Sometimes your clients, and you know this well, have either a really good year or a really bad year when it comes to drug spending. So if you expand that scope outward, since 2007, when Part D was first put in place, 6.76 million, so six and three quarter million, uh, would have benefited from this $2,000 out-of-pocket maximum, which is about 11% of beneficiaries uh, overall, give or take a few, depending on how you round and what digit you round to. So uh, the big takeaway here is for, you you know, in those times when your beneficiaries may have a bad year of drug spending, they'll find themselves, uh, can find themselves protected here. But we should note that only 11% of beneficiaries since the inception of Part D uh, would have benefited from this particular max. So I, I've talked a little bit so far about how Part D carriers, whether they're standalone or MAPDs, are on the hook for more drugs, uh, more expensive drugs over that $2,000 max. Um, let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about what that might do to premiums, but I do see the chat flowing here in the background here as well. Should be Thank good you. for now. Okay. Thank you, Chelsea, for keeping an eye on that. Um, yeah, I will absolutely uh, get these out to you and we'll, uh, as part of the follow-up email with the webinar here. So let's talk about Part D premiums. And I, I guess the, the best way to 
you know, the not maybe not the best, but the, the most lighthearted way to ex explain what's going to happen to your clients is that, uh, yes, we or CMS and uh, the Congress installed this two thousand dollar cap, uh, which looks good on paper, right? A lot like Than you know Thanos's misguided idea of snapping half the universe out of existence. What is it going to cost? Well, it's going to cost you a lot going forward here. Um, and let's talk what we mean, uh, you know, about what I mean by it'll cost them a lot going forward. First thing we need to talk about is what's called the base beneficiary premium. Um, what that is, is a share of the average bid for basic Part D benefits or the minimum plan. So every year when uh, Part D sponsors, again, standalone or MAPD, say yes, we would like to offer Part D coverage, they have to a bit, uh, put what's called a bid in, and the bid has two parts. The first bid says, this is how much we think it will cost to provide a, you know, prescription coverage at the basic level. So that's uh, what I showed you a few slides ago uh, for this particular county, this particular population. And the second part of their bid says what they think it will cost and how beneficiaries will be impacted if they uh, offer an enhanced plan in that area. So when we look at the base beneficiary premium, which is the number I'm about to show you, it is only bids on basic benefits because that's the most apples to apples comparison we can do here. Um, comparing the enhanced bids uh, isn't really helpful from a statistical mathematical standpoint. I should note that what, we're, what I'm about to show you here is not a representation of the true cost of any one plan. And in, indeed, it's just an average of what carriers have bid to cover basic benefits in a given service area. So let's take a look at what that has done historically and what is projected to do in 2025. In 2020, uh, let me just start from the beginning here. So the Inflation Reduction Act put in a premium stabilization provision on the Part D uh, base beneficiary premium. That provision limits the year-over-year -year increase in this figure to 6% per year. And the first year this provision was, effect, was in effect was 2024. And CMS is also obligated to report to us, not like me, but all of us, the public, what the base pen beneficiary premium would have been without that 6% cap in place. In 2024, so we would have seen that jump come up to 39.35, uh, this would, have, would have been without that 6% cap. But because the cap in, was in place, our cap, the, uh, the base beneficiary premium we're living under here is $34.70. Looking ahead to 2025, though, we see that, uh, yeah, there's only a $2 or so, $2 and change increase in the base beneficiary premium, $2.08 if, uh, if I'm doing my math correctly here, which doesn't sound so bad. But then you realize that that's as much as they can raise it as they're permitted by law, right? Because if this 6% cap weren't in place, the actual average bid, right, from uh, for basic benefits would have been $55.98, a 42% increase. Meaning that carriers think it's going to be, because of all the Part D changes, it's going to be about 42% more expensive for them to provide the same level of basic coverage uh, in 2025 as they are providing right now. Again, these numbers aren't reflective of any one beneficiary will pay for any one plan, but what the base beneficiary premium does is it does soften the blow of Part D LEPs a little bit um, because that Part D LEP is 1% of this number, not built on 1% of this number. Uh, that could, you know, 1% of this number times the number of months ineligible could add up even more quickly, right, if this cap weren't in place. Um, so again, the, the, the number here that we want to be mindful of is this is what your uh, Part D LEPs, sorry, will be based on, but this is what carriers actually think it's going to cost to provide basic benefits. So we, and we can infer from that that premiums will undoubtedly go up when they are unveiled. Um, you've no doubt seen or not seen some communication from carriers about uh, their 
Medicare Advantage and Part D plans and when they'll be released. I, as we have worked with some of our carrier partners, uh, where in the past has been an always almost an arms race to get information out in July, right? Or uh, you know, shortly after AHIP was out. Now everyone is kind of bidding, rebidding, and talking with CMS about what they actually can and can't do with their plans and premiums. Um, but we do have it on pretty good authority because the uh, CMS rebid window ends on in September that all plan materials from every carrier should be available on or about September 4th. That includes Part D premiums for both uh, for your standalone plans and otherwise. And yes, this is likely going to be a huge trap uh, topic of product trainings. So we don't have access to bids. That's not public information. So we can't tell you exactly what any carrier said it might cost them to, uh, to provide coverage in one area. All we have are these national figures over here. Carrier-specific information, we'll have to let the carriers release, like I said, in September. CMS did, does, though, have access to all the bids. And uh, in late July, just before our summit, so on July 29th, they said they also released some guidance saying, wow, <laughs> carriers, that, those are some pretty big premiums you got there. We should, we're going to help you out with that. Um, and what they have done is put together a premium stabilization demonstration program. Uh, this demonstration program, we shouldn't mention, is, uh, or I should stay, this is me on my soapbox. The only reason, you know, CMS or any other entity puts together a stabilization program is because those premiums do need stabilizing. Um, here's what the program does. Uh, carriers had through August 5th to declare their participation in the program, but those decisions are private. We don't know uh, whether any one carrier has chosen or not to participate in the program yet. Uh, CMS, but for carriers that do choose to opt in, this, uh, CMS will reduce that base beneficiary premium for that plan uh, by $15. By So essentially they're providing them some, some additional subsidy uh, to reduce the premium for all beneficiaries by $15 in those plans. And they do that if and only if the Part D plans agree, and this is again standalone Part D plans, if they agree not to increase their premiums year over year by, $35, uh, by less than $35. Uh, and that their capping premium increases, by the way, at $35 should also tell us that uh, that, that somehow is an acceptable increase for, uh, for CMS. So I hate to see what you know people who don't use this program are raising their premiums by. CMS has sweetened the pot too for carriers. They're incentivizing participation here. And if the plan actually ends up losing money here, right? So if uh, their costs exceed 105% of what the plan thinks it will, Medicare, the government, taxpayers are gonna pick up 90% of the additional loss that carriers might experience there on the back end. So, uh, in short, carrier or CMS took a look at what carriers saying. Here's what we think Part D coverage will cost us. Here's what we think you know the premium that we need to charge to to make all the math work. C CMS says mm, that's probably not going to fly well with consumers. We're going to help you out and give you a little bit of, uh, of funding to help offset these premium increases. But and it seems that with everything Medicare and rules this year, there's a, there's always a but. On August 9th, a few days ago, uh, some members of Congress wrote a letter to uh, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, to determine whether or not this program is actually legal, whether or not CMS can actually install a demonstration program like this, uh, and that decision has not been made yet. So uh, we will keep you posted as we learn more about that. But just know that uh, everything here is subject to change, and if this program is somehow found uh, not legal, then we may see some uh, uh, some real impact to Part D premiums for your beneficiaries coming in contract year 2025. There are some other, other likely impacts that, uh, so aside from premiums that I want to prepare you for, and again, carriers ha haven't come public with this, but we do know a bit about how the bidding process works and how they can kind of shift dollars around to make uh, the math work. 
It is entirely possible you may see deductibles added to lower tiers. So for a long time, uh, we haven't seen deductibles on tiers one, two, or three on a lot of PDPs. It is entirely possible that we could see deductibles added to those tiers um, to help make some of the math work for carriers. We could see them remove drugs from formulators completely, right? Now, that doesn't mean they're, they're going to say, we're not going to cover anything anymore. If you're going to offer Medicare coverage, you have to offer a specific number of drugs, or you have to cover, rather, a specific number of drugs in a set number of drug classes. But it could mean they'll cover, choose to cover less drugs in that class. And, or, uh, and so that might be something to consider as your uh, consumers are shopping prescriptions in the fall. They could also choose to move drugs to different tiers. So you may see uh, drugs move up or down tiers, right, to encourage or discourage uses, usage. And that might happen in uh, conjunction with utilization management, right? So you could see more step therapy restrictions put in place. You could see more prior, author, prior auths put in place um, because a lot of the prior auth rules that we've talked about in the past are only for medical services, right? Not necessarily for Part D prescription drugs. So that those are all possibilities as well. Again, nothing set in stone. You'd have to look for carrier trainings when they come out. Um, but those are all likely levers that we expect some or all carriers could pull to make their Part D plans work for them and still be able to keep them open. So lots of stuff changing about Part D. I, I saw, I, I believe it was Jill, if I looked I remember the chat said, yeah, this graphic is a really good thing to share with clients. So I want to ask you, our agent folks, you want to compliantly com communicate these changes to your clients. You want to educate them about what's going on in the market and you know what they need to look out for. How could you compliantly do so? Could you, A, before October 1st, send an email to your clients and prospects about Part D changes? Could you B, after October 1st, send an email about Part D changes to all your clients? C, after October 1st, recommend an annual review of prescriptions due to possible formulary changes? Or D, after October 15th, recommend an annual review of prescriptions due to possible formulary changes? There may be more than one answer here, so go ahead and put as many letters in as you feel is appropriate. And we'll check in on the chat. Only because I've seen the question a couple of times, I just want to say, yes, this recording will 100% be available on YouTube within a day. So this time tomorrow, if you really want to hear us all over again, I don't blame you. You can, you are more than welcome to see us again on YouTube. And I'll send out the um, a PDF of these slides as well on the email you'll get thanking you for um, coming to this webinar that you get around this time uh, tomorrow. We are getting some, uh, some level of agreement about some of these things in the chat here. I'll give you a few more minutes to think about what you want to put in here. Okay, I'm seeing near unanimous agreement for those of you who have put, uh, put in an answer so far around D. Yeah, after for Part D, you can recommend it uh, during AEP. You can absolutely recommend it, review of prescriptions due to possible formulary changes, right? Taking a look at uh, letter C, so I guess we're working in reverse alphabetical order here for this question. Uh, looking at C, after October 1st, so in that pre-AEP period, Yes, you, you can reach out and you can recommend a review of prescriptions due to for, formulary changes. During that pre-AEP time, you are able to talk about 2025 product and you can specifically mention AEP, say AE, because you can say AEP is coming up in that pre-AEP time. In I, letter A and B, I want to talk about together. Uh, they are both educational in nature. You're not talking about products. You're not specifically advertising AEP in those messages. Uh, if you craft them diligently, right? You're just saying, hey, Medicare is changing. Here's what to expect in 25. Uh, as long as you don't mention AEP, you don't talk about products or anything like that, uh, you can send those educational emails. You can have an educational 
event. You can put some uh, a factoid in your newsletter as long as you don't mention AEP itself or anything else before October 1st. Um, so all of these really could, could work for you. But for those of you who want to be a little more safe, a little more secure and make sure you're, you know, you don't have to be really, although with Medicare, you do have to be mindful of your conversation. But the, the, the I guess the, the least, the options that would least trip you up could be options C and D here. But any of them could work. Let's also talk for a bit about creditable coverage. And this is an important reason, even though uh, our audience here deals mostly in individual Medicare, you may work in groups or it's likely you know someone or have someone that is Medicare eligible, but has still taken their uh, group insurance for whatever reason. And so we need to talk about some possible impacts of creditable coverage and what your groups might, are your groups, what your beneficiaries might need to do here uh, in response to some of these changes coming up. So as a reminder, let's talk about what credible coverage is. Uh, of course, it's coverage that is at least as good or better than the standard Part D benefit. So if we think back to the slide that everyone loves <laughs> and says they want to share with their clients to explain some of the increases, um, that, again, is a picture of the standard Part D benefit. So if it's going to be creditable in, in, in CMS's eyes, it's got to be as good or better than that plan. Uh, actuaries or whoever does this work for employer plans must certify whether a plan is creditable each year. So CMS doesn't have anything to do with that other than to take note of Yes, this um, the plan passed these tests, or no, the plan is not credible. But the uh, the plan itself is required to report that to CMS. And because we have a lot of individual focused agents here, this is the note that appears on the scr uh, screen. But there's a few other things I'll share with you here too. Um, but at a minimum, by October 15th of every year, a an employer plan has to tell its Medicare eligible employees whether coverage will be creditable for the upcoming year. So before AEP be begins, your Medicare eligibles need to know whether or not their employer coverage will be creditable. There are a few other deadlines. Uh, if so, if you dabble in group or you or, or if you have some group business that you want to be aware of, um, or even if you have Medicare eligibles that are that are uh, joining people here, uh, groups also have to give notice of creditable coverage uh, during someone's or before someone's IEP begins for Medicare Part D. They also need to talk about um, their, uh, they also need to provide that notice before anyone changes a Part D plan here as well. And importantly, whenever the employer no longer offers prescription drug coverage or, and here's the important one, changes their coverage so that it's no longer creditable. So by October 15th, your plan, your, your groups, or not your groups, well, maybe your groups, but the your beneficiaries' employers will have no heard from their employers and their plans whether the group is right of coverage will be creditable for next year. And there are two ways that a plan can achieve credibility. One is uh, the first one is to pass a series of long and complicated actuarial tests outlined by CMS. Be honest, I'm not an actuary. I don't know if many of you are here. Uh, so we'll leave it at that. There's a lot of math that goes into it to figure out whether or not the plan will be creditable or not. The second one, and we typically see this with uh, small to mid-sized um, uh, self-funded plans who use this particular methodology here. But I also know that a lot of our agents work in small to mid-sized self-funded. Uh, so I wanna be careful with this here. Um, the simplified determination uh, method uh, can be used if a plan meets these criteria and can, uh, the plan can also use these criteria to be marked creditable. First one is that the plan must cover both uh, plant brands and generic drugs. Second one is that it must provide a reasonable access to retail providers nearby where it's, its coverage area. Um, Third, it must pay on the average at least 60% of expenses, so at least be equivalent to a bronze plan, if you want to think about it in ACA language. And fourth, it must satisfy at least one or two of these uh, two conditions 
one of two of these two conditions depending on the actual plan design. If the plan does have carved out prescription drug coverage, right? So the, the drug deductible, the drug coverage, it's not integrated with the health coverage. If the plan has no annual max or its annual max benefit exceeds 25,000, or if the plan pays at least 2,000 uh, annual, annually per Medicare eligible individual, it can meet be credible coverage that way. But uh, especially with a lot of smaller group plans, you might not always have the option to carve up in RX coverage. In many times that prescription coverage is integrated with the health benefit here. In those cases, if the plan is gonna be creditable, the deductible has gotta be less than $250. Uh, no annual max or the annual max must exceed $25,000 for drug benefits and no less than $1 million combined max for all benefits on that plan, including health, uh, prescription, dental, vision, whatever happens to be, in, be included in that particular benefit. Not a ton of plans qualify this way, but for those that do, I do have good news for you if you happen to work with self-funded folks. That CMS uh, did choose to retain that simplified method for 2025, but it will reevaluate that method for 2026 and beyond. It is possible that plans who qualify to using that method, though not guaranteed, so I need to use that really heavy disclaimer, that an employer who used simplified methodology, methodology to be creditable in 2024, so this year, will also be creditable next year. And again, that's kind of like my dip into talking about self-funded and simplified uh, plans and, and what you might expect depending on what you know about your clients here going forward. The other thing though, if you think about fully insured plans, carriers are often do a lot of work to notify you of whether coverage will be credible coming up. Some carriers uh, choose to include that information directly in the renewal package, which makes it a lot easier for uh, these sorts of things. Some carriers like United Healthcare offered a service where they will uh, directly mail letters, right? Saying, hey, you're enrolled in this plan. It will or will not, will not be creditable for this year. And some carriers like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and Blue Care Network do provide what uh, we call pass fail charts. And the, I, I'll talk a little bit about the methodology here for just a moment. Ultimately, it is the group's responsibility to communicate to its members whether or not coverage will be creditable. The carrier doesn't really bear any responsibility in CMS's eyes for this communication. However, lots of carriers do provide this as a service for their fully insured groups. Uh, that said, let's take a look at pass fail charts and uh, you as the agent would probably want to be aware of the existence of these and where to find these. Uh, so you can work with your groups so they can inform their members uh, in the future. Um, we should notice that or note that the chart you see on your screen is for 2024. We are beating down every door we can at Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, BCN to get a 2025 chart available. I just want to give you a taste of, uh, of what's to come here coming forward. Um, they, uh, Blue Cross, BCN, they published these pass-fail charts. They're avail this is available for you inside insurability here as well. And what the pass-fail chart does is takes a look at every plan each carrier offers in every product family and tells you whether they pass that ser series of tests from CMS or they fail the series of tests from CMS. We should note that in 2024, just based on what's on the screen here, there are plans that do not offer creditable coverage. In particular, Simply Blue HSA PPO Bronze and uh, Simply Blue Routine Care PPO Bronze, um, <clears throat> who did not pass that test, right? Meaning if a employer offers those plans and a Medicare eligible person enrolls in those plans, they've got to figure out something else to do to get creditable drug coverage and avoid a Part D LEP down the road. Again, uh, this chart is currently available inside insurability. Uh, as soon as we have the 2025, we'll make sure we get that out to uh, everyone that's interested. We'll also publish that insurability as well. But just note that that is how Blue Cross, who uh, many of you might have a deep relationship with, uh, is, is probably handling this going forward. So I, if you get that, right, and you get that chart next year and uh, you find out that your uh, either your clients or your whether it's your group or maybe your employee uh, your, your client who's Medicare eligible, uh, even though your 
you know, you're working Medicare. 20 or January of 2025 comes around and coverage isn't going to be credible. What do we do now? A few important facts that you'd want to find to be able to help uh, counsel either both your groups and Medicare eligible individuals on what comes next for them. You're going to want to know how many people are employed at that firm because that Medicare rule of 20 does impact uh, how Part A and Part B will act and behave in the, in the background, whether they'll be secondary or primary to the group insurance. And that's important because you need to enroll in at least one of Part A or B in order to pick up a Part D plan. You'll want to know whether medical or RX cut. Uh, medical and prescription coverage are integrated in the same plan or carved out. If they are carved out, uh, maybe the group can shop around that prescription coverage or choose a different option that does offer them um, a, a credible coverage option within that. If they are integrated and it's uh, not credible coverage, that pre presents a different set of options for your beneficiary going forward. You'll also want to know whether your medical, medical Medicare eligible is enrolled in parts A and or B, again, because that's going to impact some enrollment timelines for you coming up. In particular, and this is kind of overgeneralizing things because there's lots of ways that this can go. So note that this is not every solution, but this is generally two camps you, you could fall in going forward. <laughs> Your beneficiary, your Medicare eligible, could choose to keep their group, group health plan. And in that case, they would at a minimum want to enroll in part A and or B. Uh, it's up to the group and carrier and their, uh, their rules, uh, whether they require that part B, especially if the group is paying primary. Um, so that, that's an option. And I say A and or B because you only need one of those to enroll in a part D drug plan. Uh, because that Part D drug plan, the standalone PDP, is what's going to be the source of creditable coverage going forward to uh, uh, to allow them to avoid the uh, Part D uh, late enrollment penalty. So if they choose to stay it, or choose to stay at the group health plan, they enroll in Part A or B, they can use their initial enrollment period, uh, or if they're already enrolled, they're lost to creditable coverage SCP or even AEP to enroll in a standalone PDP. And once they have do, done that, Medicare payer rules will apply. So if the employer is smaller than 20, um, the Medicare plan will pay first for drugs. If the employer is uh, greater than 20, then the employer plan will pay first for drugs in this case, and the Part D plan will kick in uh, the rest. Or your Medicare eligibles have the option to leave the group health plan. That's always an option for them too. In that case, it's probably it's likely they'd want to enroll in both parts A and B, uh, and use their new initial enrollment period or their new to Part B enrollment period to enroll in either a Medicare uh, or an MAPD or a PDP of their choice. Um, and they could also use their MedSup OEP to enroll in a MedSup plan if they decide that's a better option for them going forward. And again, they could use that loss of credible coverage SEP to enroll in a MedSup or, or a PDP as appropriate uh, with guaranteed issue rights in that case as well. So lots of different things that they could do uh, heading onward. But a lot of that is, is anxiety, right? Because we don't always know and you won't know till a certain date this year. When will your Medicare eligibles know whether their existing employer-sponsored coverage is credible? Is it A, before October 1st of each year, B, before October 15th, C, before December 7th of each year, or D, before December 31st of each year. We did have a question in the chat. Um, Kim asked, what happens to HSA plans where the integrated deductible includes RX and needs to have a deductible in 2024 higher than $1,600? And wouldn't they then need to use the actuarial determination and not the simplified determination to know if that credit that co that coverage was credible in theory because they're not meeting that two hundred fifty dollars deductible, right? Right. So Kim, uh, if I, I'm going to give folks a little bit of uh, time to chime in on this one here as well, but it is likely. So for example, if we go back to this um, credible coverage chart here, you would actually I. I do have some HSA plans there. Um, so the plan, these plans that, that qualify here, 
may still qualify, as Chelsea said, based on the really long set of actuarial tests. Not necessarily that, that this more the, sim the simplified determination that hinges only on the deductible here. Um, but again, that's up to Blue Cross's actuaries to determine it and do the actual test there to figure out whether or not that happens. So we'd really have to wait until we get a 2025 edition of, of this from Blue Cross, uh, for example, to see uh, whether they think their coverage will pass. Now, if their coverage does is not found credible at that point, well, then you kind of have the same options you always have when you have not credible coverage. Do you work with the group to shop for other benefits uh, or to shop for at least one plan that does offer credi credible coverage? Do you uh, do what we, you know, oops, suggested this way, where they uh, pick up a, a standalone Part B D to round out their drug coverage and get them to that credible threshold? There's, there's lots of options going forward uh, that you might have there. Let's talk a little bit about what will and won't count toward troop here as we head toward the home stretch. Um, as we talk about troop, there are some minor adjustments to what does and does not count. Uh, in So in 2024, what does count this year is everything here in the, uh, the green rectangle. So uh, really that's part D enrollee spending. So what your beneficiaries are spending and what the part D plan is spending what dr uh, drug manufacturers are spending does not count toward troop. Uh, even here this year, that 10% uh, does not count toward troop here because that's drug manufacturers over here, but 90% of what your folks uh, spend in the initial coverage stage does count toward troop. Um, so uh, as a quick summary of that, you know, you've got them some things that do count. You've got what spending by beneficiary, the Part D plan, if they have any supplemental uh, commercial insurance that comes in here that would contour their troop uh, and move them into <coughs> uh, the initial coverage phase or catastrophic phase as appropriate. Egg whips or employer group waiver plans. Uh, any qualified programs you see there on the left hand side. What does not count though to our troop, and we should call these out, um, is spending by federal government programs. That's why the manufacturer discount program over here, which we see in blue does not count toward troop. Anything that TRICARE spends does not count. So if you're working with veterans, that won't count toward troop. And any non-qualified assistance programs, of course, won't count toward troop either. Um, we should talk briefly about the prescription payment plan before we wrap up here for today as well. Uh, what, uh, who's eligible for it? What does it do? It does allow all Part D enrollees to pay out-of-pocket drug costs in capped monthly payments or installments. Um, so it really allows them to, it's that smoothing provision. It allows them to spread their drug costs out over the calendar year. How does it work? Anyone with a drug that costs over $600 per month is going to be notified when they go to uh, pick up that drug at the pharmacy. They'll be notified of the existence of the plan. But your beneficiaries will have to opt in by contacting their Part D plan, and they can do so at any time. And from that point forward, what the Part D plan will do is combine all of their expected out-of-pocket prescription costs and devise those into equal payments over the rest of the year. Your member will then owe zero dollars at the pharmacy for uh, all their any covered drug. We should make that point clear for any covered drug. And instead, the Part D sponsor is collecting payment from your beneficiary via these installment plans. And the Part D sponsor is in turn forking that money over to the pharmacy so the pharmacy is made whole and paid in full. There are some ways that uh, the repayment plan can be canceled. Of course, your beneficiaries are free to leave the program at any time. Carriers can uh, involuntarily terminate that payment plan after a grace period of not less than two months. So specific uh, carrier guidelines might vary here, but they've got to give you at least a two month grace period if the beneficiary does not make their out of their scheduled out of pocket payments to the carrier. However, even though they may terminate the repayment plan, the carrier cannot terminate Part D coverage if uh, your beneficiary does not pay their out of pocket cost to the carrier. Although they can terminate Part D coverage if they do leave premiums unpaid. So want to make sure that distinction is clear. If they fall behind on their out-of-pocket payments, carrier can kick them out of the repayment program, but they can't terminate coverage, fall behind on premium payments, 
then yeah, we're looking at a different story. If your beneficiary does happen to switch their Part D plan while they're in a payment program, they would have to re-enroll in the program with the new carrier of their choice. Um, and we'd have to find out more from business rules about carriers, about whether they would need to re-enroll, even if they switch PDPs within the same carrier, that may be up to carrier discretion here as well. As we wrap then, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you again for your time and attention. If you remember nothing else from here today, the big news you need to know is your beneficiaries going forward are going to have a $2,000 out-of-packet maximum yet next year, which sounds great until you realize premiums will be higher. Uh, it may be harder to access some drugs they need, and there's questions about whether or not their drugs, uh, at least the drugs they're on, will continue to be covered by their carrier of choice. It's entirely possible uh, HDHPs will remain creditable, um, but uh, to be honest, HDHPs with like super high deductibles, 7,500, anything you know higher than that, uh, they may struggle to find themselves creditable here. Um, so be prepared for that and know what options your beneficiaries have going forward. And we should also mention that as uh, part of the prescription payment program, your beneficiaries can spread payments out throughout the year. Should you have any questions, comments, concerns, or curse words about what you've heard today, I encourage you to reach out uh, via any of these methods here. Uh, you can always find us at, on LinkedIn at the Action Benefits Company. You can talk to Chelsea and I directly at our email, learning at actionbenefits.com, or reach our main line, 248-356-8585. That, ladies and gentlemen, does conclude uh, my spiel here this morning. But Chelsea and I are happy to stick around for any questions you might have and uh if you must leave, though, please do enjoy the rest of your day. It looks like it's going to be a good one today. Thank you all so much for spending some time here with us today.